Hello everyone, I'm Babla Jonathan and this is the insight. You're welcome to this edition of the program, the socio-political and security impasse rocking the two Anglophone regions, the Northwest and Southwest regions of the Republic of Cameroon has continued deepening. Many have died, many continue dying, many have been injured and many of them have been handicapped for life. Thousands have fled their homes and are now living in bushes while thousands have equally fled their homes and are now seeking refuge in neighboring Nigeria. Many of them living in precarious conditions. Villages have been burned down several houses bent down the crisis has taken a new twist with high level destruction both on human beings and uh, goods materials and of course uh, properties these are some of the things that we'll be taking a look at in this edition of the program and we are receiving a crisis management uh, and safety crisis and safety management expert and former United States uh, Senate uh, candidate will be taking a look at all this and of course the urgent need for a way out of the crisis. Stay with us. Joining us again in this edition of the program is Charles Nana. He is a crisis and safety management expert and former United States Senate candidate. You're welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a ple always a pleasure being in Cameroon and uh, being at uh, in your antenna. Being in Cameroon at a time when the country is on fire, so to speak, looking at what is happening today in the northwest and southwest regions of the country with the high-level destructive twist that the Anglophone crisis has taken. Yes, <clears throat> what I say is a pleasure being in Cameroon and uh, within your antenna, but it's also a difficult time uh, being in Cameroon. And uh, some of us have been watching for the last uh, two years with this crisis, how it has unfolded. And uh, we are trying uh, to add our own two cents to bring this crisis to an end. The future of Cameroon is being decimated, uh, either from the government standpoint, the military, and also those who are in the bushes. So we are, uh, uh, hopefully, will, cool heads will prevail and will try to bring this crisis to an end. Because the future, we cannot allow this crisis to continue. And the situation at the moment is quite deplorable, pathetic, desperate. It's, it's, it's more than desperate because we see what is happening on the field. We see uh, gendarmes being killed. Uh, uh, we see innocent people being killed. We see villages burned down. Uh, and that is not the Cameroon we know. That is not the Cameroon we want to live for our children. That is not the Cameroon that every investor in the world who wanted to come, wanted to, come to, to Africa and was looking for a place, the number one thing Cameroon was able to sell was its stability. It's a very stable country, you are free to go there and do business and you will not be disturbed. But within the last two years and more importantly within the last uh, year, you cannot tell an investor that if they come to Cameroon and they choose to do business in Nimbe, Boya or Bamenda, they are free to go wherever they want. And that is an advantage Cameroon had uh, relative to other African countries. We have to do what we can to make sure Cameroon does not become a, an African statistics. As you know, each time that we talk, people talk about Africa, they always talk about conflict, they talk about crisis, they talk about war, they talk about hunger. We can change that. We do not want Cameroon to be another statistics. We have the capabilities, we have the intellectuals, we have the experts. Let's bring them to the table and turn Cameroon around. The, the future, let me put it this way. The best days for Cameroon is still ahead. Cameroon's best days are still ahead. Let's realize it. Unfortunately, the best days have been compromised today by uh, even people who ought to uh, protect these best days that you're talking about. Yes, the, yes, because we cannot come to the table. As, as, you, as we go along, again, my position has been very clear, and the last week I, since I've been in Cameroon, I want to move forward. I always start with a position that a lot, a lot of mistakes have been made, all the way back to 1961, right? You had John Gu Foncha and his delegation who went to negotiate the formal accord without being prepared. They did not understand the Francophone mentality. They did not, they did not have the expertise to negotiate in Fuman. You have 
1972 constitution where we were 1970 when we moved from uh, a federal republic of cameroon into a united republic of cameroon in violation of our constitution because the cameroon constitution of 1961 article 47.1 clearly states that any attempt that threatens the unity or the integrity of the federal state of, the, of government was unacceptable, was unreceivable. Then they even went further on Article 47.3 and stated that even if there are changes to the constitution of the, of, of the Federal Republic of Cameroon, it has to be approved by the National Assembly by a majority vote. But before it gets approved by the, 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 the National Assembly, it has to be approved by the Assembly in West Cameroon and the assembly in East Cameroon. None of that did occur. So there are a lot of mistakes. Then we move from uh, uh, the, uh, the, the United Republic of Cameroon to the Republic of Cameroon, which was the name of the Francophone part of the nation of territory before independence. So a lot of mistakes have been made. I want, my hope is that we move forward. We that, that's the genesis of uh, the problem which Cameroon is going through today. And talking about mistakes that were made in the past, uh, mistakes are still being made today. Many consider uh, the statements of Atangan Jipol, Minister of Territorial Administration, as a big mistake that is uh, People like El Hash Lawan Bako, the national president of the United Democratic Party, have even gone further to describe him as the problem, or one of the problems of Anglophones. Remember that at the beginning of this uh, crisis, he said there is no Anglophone crisis. He, he later on uh, changed position, but recently he has uh, come out with other statements again, saying that Anglophones are not marginalized. Uh, those who have been detained uh, are being detained because they are afraid that if they come out, their brothers will kill them. They are living in better conditions than even when they were in Nigeria, and many such statements. <clears throat> I, cannot com I cannot comment on Mr. Ntanganji's statement because I don't know precisely when it was said and what he said. But my point is this. Way, the, the, the way things have been going, we use anglophones to make things worse for anglophones. If an anglophone who has gone through the system in Cameroon and does not believe that it's an anglophone problem, then I don't know in what world he exists or in what world he grew up. I'll take a simple example, and I like to bring this as a simple example. I'm a son, I was born in, in, in Manfi. I grew up in Boya and Yawundi. I went to school like every anglophone, but when I went to the university, out of all the professors I had, I had one professor that taught in English. One. I am a son of Cameroon. I get all the way to the university and I'm learning or I'm being taught by teachers who speak a language that I do not understand. Or it's not my first language. I'm the only professor who teaches in the language that I'm comfortable with. It's, a zero, it's one professor and the weight was zero. Uh, 0 0.5 because I was a system, 0 virgule said. But more importantly, I decided to take an exam to go to one of the top schools in Cameroon called NCIAD in Gaoundere. They gave me the question. I spent an hour and I could not understand what they were asking me in the question. The questions were written in French. They took a francophone to translate it from French to English. And that francophone was not humble enough to say he cannot translate into an English that an Anglophone can understand. Then how do you expect an Anglophone who does uh, uh, the Anglophone system, has an A levels, wants to go to an institution of higher learning in his own country, but he cannot understand what they are asking him in an exam. Then he cannot do well. And he explains why we do not have a lot of Anglophones in top positions in the country. So some of us, when that happened, I left Cameroon, I went to the United States. I ended up, well, I went to the United States, I did a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, I have a master's in biomedical engineering, and I have an MBA from the University of Chicago School of Business. It's the number one, it's the top number one business school, not only in the United States, but in the world. Did you leave the country because you were frustrated by this? Of course, of course, we have to be clear. If I go to a university in my own country, where I, am, I, I believe I'm a citizen with all the rights, out of over 15 professors, I have only one that speaks the language that I, that I understand best. Number two, 
When he comes in class, francophones are throwing uh, uh, paper plates at uh, Moyo, 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 and disrupts the class. So you are in a system which was not designed for someone like you. But the issue is, and that's why I said I want to move forward because and so, lots of and mistakes so, were made. And, and despite all of that and many other things that people are decrying, an elite can stand up today. Uh, even though he's no longer considered as an elite by many uh, from his area of origin and say that Anglophones were not marginalized and even go further like other government officials have maintained so far despite the deplorable situation on the ground that uh, Kam has returned to many parts of the two Anglophone regions of the country. Well, I'll start, by, but I'll start from the word elite. Who is an elite and who defines an elite, right? If you come from uh, Bali, the people from Bali do not recognize you as an elite in Bali. Then where are you an elite from? Is it because uh, someone appointed you director of something that makes you an elite? What, who is an elite? An elite is someone that aspires and inspires his people. An elite is someone who gives hope to the youth. An elite is someone that gives hope to his people. So if you want to tell me, I don't know who you're referring to, but if that individual, whoever you're talking about, is not someone that his people look up to, his people get excited to meet him, his people want to make sure, want to follow his footsteps, he's a role model. Because an elite is a role model. So I don't know who you're talking about. And if your the people are hurting, well, the Minister of Territorial Administration, I don't know him, so I cannot speak what I don't know. See, I am, I am I'm first an engineer and a businessman before I got into politics. So I'm very, very clear in my, in, my, in, 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 in my articulations. What I don't know, I don't speak about. I don't know him personally, so I cannot, do, but from what I, I, I think I've seen, I saw one interview a while back where he said there was no anglophone problem. The only question is, in what planet has he been? Right? There's no anglophone in Cameroon who will say there's no anglophone problem. We are pretty much, I, I gave them a simple example of, of when, I, when I went to the university. Out of all my classes, I had only one in English. And even when you go to ministries or you go to places in, 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 in Yaoundé, you want to speak in English, they say, I want to comprend by l'anglais. Cameroon was founded, or the, the, the Federal Republic of Cameroon, the Constitution of 1961, it was, it, it, it's a result of Article 1541 of the United Nations that stipulated how territories supposed to come together and form a union. And those territories was the French Cameroon and the English Cameroon. And the conditions for some of those were equal status, bicultural, bilingual. Can you tell me today that Cameroon is bicultural and bilingual based on what we see? Lots of documents and are only in and French. And denying all these uh, facts that you're highlighting sounds like provocation, sounds like a, 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 a hate speech, sounds like something that is going to push people more to uh, become radical. Well, well, I will not say it's a hate speech because hate speech carries a lot of connotation. I will say it was, it's provocative. But I will not say it's a hate speech, right? Because when you start saying about it, you say it's a hate speech, hate speech carries different, different connotation. But yes, it's, it's very provocative that a son of the Anglophone region, an Anglophone, would, by all rights, does not believe that there is an Anglophone problem. Then, again, but again, you know, in every, in every, it's what we call law of numbers. You always have outliers. We don't, make, we don't make decisions based on the few outliers who believe for whatever reason, because again, I will not try to guess why he, he, he's making those type of statements, but clearly the president of the United, uh, the president of Cameroon had recognized that there is a microphone problem. All right, we're going to take a short break. Yes. Time for us to take a look at what the newspapers reported this week. Smart Jigan Gebre with the press review. The meeting between Ambazonian leaders and lawyers, the deepening Anglophone crisis and elections are some of the major news highlights this week. The media reports that ahead of their trial, three lawyers have visited Seseko, Ayuk and Co. at the State Defense Secretariat in Yaoundé. It is reported in the Guardian Post that the lawyers have confirmed that the Met detained Seseko, Ayuk Tabi and other separatist leaders. 
the voice says ayuk tasang mfo mfo and eight others resurface after months of incommunicado detention according to Eden, sisiku and co are alive and as lawyers begin proceedings their appearance in court is imminent in an exclusive interview a prominent francophone lawyer tells the guardian post that federalism is the only solution to the anglophone crisis the horizon qualifies president bia's emergency humanitarian aid plan as a phase saving marshall plan for the northwest and southwest regions in the meantime the post weekend reports the deepening situation in the northwest and southwest regions with territorial administration minister atanganji paul qualified as an anglophone problem by the national united democratic party president elhaj lawan bako despite the worsening situation painted bleak by an elections cameroon regional delegate elekan board chair insists elections will hold in the northwest and southwest regions in october According to the Ramblam, Elekan Board Chair Eno Abrams Egbe has prescribed courage, optimism against insecurity. The paper highlights what it calls smuggling of the bill on the postponement of legislative elections into parliament after statutory deadline. Welcome back. That was the press review by Smart and Gangribe. Now we're going to take a look at the way forward. It has become uh, more urgent than ever before, looking at the deplorable and devastating situation on the ground in the two Anglophone regions of the country to get the right way, the right way out of the Anglophone crisis, looking at the number of persons who are being killed on a daily basis, both civilians and uh, elements of the national armed forces, houses that are being burnt down, and entire villages that are being destroyed, thousands of persons seeking refuge in the bushes, many of them living in deplorable conditions, while there are equally thousands in neighboring Nigeria seeking refuge there in President Buhari's country. Now, you have a five-point way out of this crisis, number one. Yes. <clears throat> number one, I think I've expressed that last week I did, I did spend some time. And I, number one is immediate ceasefire by all foreign, all, all foreign parties. So all the parties that are fighting, there must be an immediate ceasefire. That's the very first thing we need to do. I know that I heard last week, I think there was a, an initiative to, to provide relief to, to those displaced individuals. But the first thing to do is an immediate uh, ceasefire. How, because, pos how possible is that? Oh, it's very possible. The government just has to declare a period of ceasefire, and I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, those that are in the bushes would also will, will, will reciprocate, will, 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 will respect that. Many, Don't, many have been demanding for the demilitarization of the two Anglophone regions of the country. In other words, the withdrawal of elements of the National Armed Forces, Security and Defense Forces from the Northwest and Southwest regions. But government is not ready to do that. But that's why I'm saying that there must be an immediate ceasefire from both sides. And once there's an immediate ceasefire from both sides, they can pull out, the government can pull out of the zone. Two, I think the issue here is really, before I go to the second point, the issue is we're looking, I'm looking for uh, confidence building initiatives because a lot of the Anglophones, a lot of those who have picked up, unfortunately, has picked up arms against the government because they believe they do not lo no longer trust the government. So and, number one is... And they too are not ready to drop their guns. Well, no one... Well, <clears throat> there are so many reasons why they might not be ready to drop their guns as well. So that's why we're asking for an immediate ceasefire on both sides. And we begin... We see the fight is intensifying. It means both sides are not willing to put down their guns. But... The, the government, future, government will say that uh, the soldiers are there to protect the population, to protect their properties, uh, and, and you're asking them to drop their guns? That is a valid reason, but it's in, you have to put that in the context. If we want to, see, we want to put this fighting in an, uh, bring this fighting to an end, an immediate end, we must declare a ceasefire on both sides. That's number one. And then maybe have the military also withdraw from some of those villages. Number two, we declare a period of national reconciliation 
for a period of between 90 and 120 days. National reconciliation means we'll bring everybody on the table, say we are one family, we made mistakes, we got into arm fighting, which was wrong, we picked up arms against the government, which is wrong, unacceptable, but on the other hand, the government or the military has to accept that they made mistakes, they had a lot of excesses when dealing with the population. The military or the gov or the military in particular has no business with civilians. But the civilians have found themselves face to face with the military. The role of the military is to protect the country against its enemies. Children of Cameroon, Cameroonian citizens, Cameroonian children are not enemies of the state. But so we have to be a little bit so I don't know how but the military finds himself face to face with the civil with the civilian population. And, that is unacceptable. And that's why if you ask uh, many in the northwest and southwest regions today they will tell you that the military has rather become an enemy. And, and, and that's most unfortunate. And that's why I said we need first that ceasefire. We declare a period of national reconciliation. But, but within that ceasefire, the military, why are we talking about confidence building initiatives? Because the population, those who have picked up arms, don't trust the military. They don't trust the army. And that is wrong. It is our national military. They are there to protect us against foreign invaders, against enemies of the state, enemies of the country. So if they today say they do not trust the military, then there is a problem. We need to figure out why, and those things will be discussed in during a, 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 during a period of national reconciliation. Third, for that to happen, mm -hmm. before we go to the uh, third uh, uh, proposal concerning the way out of this crisis, for that to happen, for that national reconciliation to happen, those who are being detained, those who have fled their country and are now in Nigeria, those who are in the bushes need to be brought back. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That was the third point. My third point was that the, 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 the release of every Cameroonian that's in jail in relation to the Anglophone crisis. Those that have been displaced, but that is why I said it's a trust-building initiative. Ceasefire, national reconciliation, release all those who are in jail, request that those who are in the bushes hiding should come back to their homes. Because once you have those elements in place, now they might begin to say the government is willing, the government has good faith, the government has understood, and this is an easy thing to do. We just admit on both sides that we've made mistakes, and we've made tons of mistakes. But the authorities will tell you that those who have committed crimes, those who have uh, killed, those who have spilled blood, should pay for their crimes, should be judged, should be condemned, should face the law. And that is why people like Sisiku Ayuktambe and his collaborators have been held despite the outcry from the civil society, uh, even from uh, out of the country, that they should be released just like you're calling on the government to do now? Yes, I think um, <clears throat> it's unfortunate. We have to differentiate between people who, re who were asking for federation and those who committed crime. If you go and, and break into a house and steal whatever they have there, it has nothing to do with the Anglophone crisis, right? But we have to make sure that those that were arrested because they asked for a form of government that we revisit the agreement that we took in 1961 which to is, come together as brothers and sisters. Which is not a crime. Which is not a crime. The form of the nation. Even if we didn't even have that in the constitution, what is wrong with your children taking a state of the nation and saying, my dear brothers and sisters, we had agreed in 1961 that we all wanted to leave Douala and travel to Yaoundé. But we found ourselves now in Gaoundere. What do we do? There's nothing wrong with that. Those of us who are married, those of us who have spouses, every two or three years, you take a step of the union of your home. Your wife or you will say, are, is, are living together, or as the French man says, vivre ensemble. Have we met objectives that we set for each other? Are we going in the right direction? Are we raising our children in the way we wanted to do so? There's nothing wrong with that. 
But the problem we have, and this is where a federated, and that is why our founding fathers wanted a federated country, because we have two separate cultures, two separate approach at doing things. You have one culture that strongly believes in the argument of force, and they have another culture which strongly believes in the force of argument. Those two cultures approach things differently, and that is where we blame the, the, the Fonja and his delegation who went to negotiate in Fumban without understanding the end goal and defining most of the operational of the issues that were negotiating in Fumban. That notwithstanding, the Cameroonians today, we have in, in 1960, 1961, we had just a handful of intellectuals. Today, Cameroonians have some of the best and brightest in the world. We rub shoulders with some of the best and brightest in the world. I've spent the last 25 years resolving crises in businesses and in communities all over the world. But yes, I recognize when we come to Cameroon, Cameroon is different, right? They don't, Cameroon does not like to bring his, his or her, her own children who are in the, in the diaspora imposing themselves to come and help resolve issues. We are Cameroonian like everybody else. We bleed. Every day we see our younger brothers, our children dying in Cameroon. It hurts us. And that is why some of us have come and say, how can we help? How can we add our technical know-how? How can we bring our expertise to bring this crisis to an end? Exactly. In the United States, please, just one, let me, I have to emphasize this. Some have taken one brush and painted everybody in the diaspora. And they want to hear mostly from the extremists. You have people who are very reserved, who are in the middle, who are saying there are merits to both sides, we understand both sides. How do we bring Cameroon? How do we realize the dreams of our founding fathers? Our founding fathers wanted a Cameroon that was bilingual, bicultural, that every single child of this nation felt that it was part of the governance of this nation. It's just unfortunate that our leaders have not understood, have not, have not understood how to channel and how to caress that energy to make Cameroon a, a, a role model of a nation. And talking about the reconciliation aspect of your proposal of the way out of the uh, crisis, you said it's going to last for uh, one month or, or so? No, I'm suggesting just like we, uh, I'm, con I'm suggesting a, a national reconciliation period or some national reconciliation period of 90 to 120 days. 90 to 120 days. Yes. What will be the content of the 90 to 120 well, we didn't, we didn't, days? What will be done during There are a lot of things. The next part, the, which is a fourth point on my agenda, is a two or three phase negotiations. If it's a two phase negotiations, one occurs in Cameroon, one occurs in the diaspora. As you can see, the diaspora, the Cameroon, the Cameroonian diaspora has been playing a very significant role in this. We all want one Cameroon, but we want a Cameroon that every child of this nation feels and is comfortable that he is part of the governance of this country. So that nego as ho ho hope would be that once we call a period of, 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 of national reconciliation, there will be a component that there will be a negotiation on the form of the state of Cameroon. We add, we made again, I want to move forward. Our parents our parents' generation, they did the best they could, right? And the wish of every child or every parent is that their child does better than they do. So our parents' generation did the best they could. We found ourselves where we are. Let the younger folks come in now and say, we have the best and the brightest. Let's fix this thing. We are one country. We have different cultures. We have different approaches. But we can live together. We can coexist. So that is the approach. That, so that's the third aspect of it. And the diaspora has been playing a very important role. And we go back again, initially I said, all of my measures, the first four measures, were all what is called confidence-building initiatives. Don't call Number your five. children... Number sorry, five. Yes. Don't call your children in the negotiations, and then once they have a different view from you, you arrest them. Right? We have seen that we have a pattern when we say, well, come, let's talk. And you say, well, let's start a meeting at 1 o'clock. The other guy says, no, let's start at 12. You arrest him and put him in jail. It doesn't make sense. All right, number five. The fifth point on the agenda is an economic component. Very, very critical. One of the greatest risks in Cameroon and in most African nations is hopelessness within our youth, unemployment within our youth. It's a blessing when you have a youthful population because they can work, they can create GDP, they can do a lot of things for the nation. But it is a time bomb 
which might have to explode someday if the youth are not employed. So I have, as a fifth point, I have an economic component. And we remember, the first. That, we remember that this uh, issue began exploding with the coffin revolution of Correct. Mancho, BBC, talking about the poor state of roads in, in Bermuda and other social Correct. problems. So, so you can see someone like Mancho, Mancho, BBC, who just complained about the state of the road, and he is in, he's been condemned for, I believe, 15 or 12 years, I don't remember the details, but he's in prison for just asking about the conditions of the roads that we have. We are all children of this country. We love this country dearly. We want to help this country develop. Then we should not be arrested for our views. No one in Cameroon should go to jail because he has an opinion different from his brother. It's just not right. Now, let's go back to the economic component. So, the first thing that I had proposed is one motor taxi, one plantation. So all of these qualified Cameroonians, people with PhDs, masters, bachelor's degree, driving motorcycles on the street, the government, along with the private sector, and I can help in that, we can work with them to, trans to transition their skill sets into plantation, into agriculture. Agriculture is very beneficial. Cameroon feeds a lot of countries in the region. We can invest in agriculture and differentiate ourselves. So let's come up with a mechanism that involves banks, microfinance, and I can help the government do that. Transition our youth, our unemployed youth that are driving taxis from, from uh, motor taxis, from doing that into agriculture, into, into, into the domain of agriculture. The second aspect of my economic uh, program is every district, one factory. Every district in the country will create one factory. And the government can do that. Cameroon is wealthy enough to take that type of initiative. What, what does that do? Number one, it prevents this rural exodus, which means everybody leaving uh, Bali or whatever part of the country and wants to come to Douala and Yaoundé to, to end their living. If there are factories in almost every district in Cameroon, our children will stay back there, they have jobs, they are comfortable, and every region of the country will develop equally. And not only that, as, as, uh, as, as part of uh, uh, doing that, we, that's, this is a second or a third component on the economy. We can invite Cameroonians who are experts in the diaspora to come home once a year for two months or once every two years and help in any, any field that they so desire or where the country thinks that there is a need. The, the first and second components yes. of the uh, economic aspects uh, are quite laudable, but when we look at the economic situation uh, of Cameroon today and we look at the, the crisis that is uh, hitting Cameroon and, of course, other countries of the Central African sub-region, uh, how possible, how feasible is that? Well, it's very feasible. We have to transition our mindset. The very first thing is we have to transition our economy from a primary, a producer of primary products to one that is value added. And by creating, when I say value added, it means you transform our raw materials. My goodness. In Cameroon, we, we plant bananas, uh, 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 cocoa, coffee, cotton, and then we export all of those raw materials. And then when we import them back, we import them at, at, at tremendous prices. We can transform them locally, and not only by transforming them locally, we teach or we train our people to, to added value products, increases our, 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 our standard of living. Because for you to have people who have the technical know-how, we have to train people who are competent to work in those factories. Cameroon has a very significant gap. We do not have the skill set that we need. Most of our schools... When the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a significant gap between the skill set that our businesses are looking for and the skill set that our, our universities and colleges are producing. And that's we where need to close that gap. And that in, in, in 1980 and 1990, when you came, you went to the United States with a degree from Cameroon, more so in the 1980s, they hired you and gave you a job without ever asking you one question. Today, you bring a degree from, from, from Cameroon, they have to send you back to do three, four years preparation before you get there because our level of education has gone down significantly because we do not invest in our education. Cameroon has one of the, some of the best and brightest. But if we don't pay our teachers, we don't pay them adequate wages, how then do you get the best teachers to teach? So the country has a long way to go. We have but bring Cameroonian children back 
the experts back to Cameroon and let them help. And you can do that by, I think that was my third on the economic point. Look Cameroonians in the diaspora with certain expertise. Invite them to come to Cameroon and offer their expertise and say in return, number one, would have a dual nationality. So it allows you to come to Cameroon and go without a lot of challenges. Number two, when you come and help a company in Cameroon, maybe we'll give you a small land in Bali, 500 meters square, you build your own house if you're from Bali. I believe you, believe me, a lot of Cameroonians who have given up on Cameroon who want to come back and add their own two cents. When they come to Cameroon and help Cameroonian children, it's 10 times better than the 500 francs or the 1,000 francs we sent to Cameroon because you're showing them how to fish. You're not giving them fish. So there is a lot we can do. Right. And that is why sometimes when I talk to folks, I give a lot of public speaking in the United States. And when I go to play, I tell people, Cameroon is our home. We in the United States, we are enjoying the sweat, the blood, and the hard work of Americans for 300 years. Let's build Cameroon. Let's build Cameroon. But on the other hand, I'm pleading with our, our authorities. Those in the diaspora, they are not strange people. They are not extremists. They are your son and children. They are your daughter, sons and daughters who have seen other ways of doing things and they want to come home and show you what they have done. Give them an opportunity to show you so. Give them, them an opportunity to be proud of being Cameroonians and they'll be your ambassadors not only in Cameroon but anywhere they go. I'll just end here by saying if you had taken one second to look at my videos online when I was running for United States Senate, everywhere I went, I always started by saying, as you can tell, I have a deep southern accent. I'm from a place 50 miles south of here called Cameroon. Right, and every we, we, American who watched the, 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 my elections went back and tried to find out where is that Cameroon that this Senate candidate is talking about every day. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a short while, noting that you were a former U.S. Uh, Senate uh, candidate, and so we're going to take interviews of the week. And when we come back, we will take a look at international involvement in the crisis rogging the Republic of Cameroon. Initially, when they were here, the communication was a little bit poor because the council was not aware of uh, their presence here. But when he eventually came to our knowledge, we already started the campaign to uh, uh, encourage groups and uh, women groups, youth groups, and so on to come with their support. And from next week, uh, many, many churches will also be coming in with uh, support uh, uh, to this, uh, particularly the children and the women that uh, uh, have been displaced, uh, uh, not uh, because of their own making, but uh, because of circumstances. I am totally satisfied because uh, uh, taking in consideration the time limit we have for uh, to organize this meeting, I do hope that uh, the, the same spirit will continue, the spirit of solidarity, spirit of cohesion, spirit of uh, what they call togetherness. So I think uh, the Adama region is uh, uh, totally committed to support our uh, brothers of uh, Southwest and Northwest uh, in, in uh, any form. We have problems with the region of our brother of uh, Northwest and Southwest. And you know, Bunaberi is receiving all our brother. And we use, and we have to continue to, re to receive them, them. But the problem is that we ask the service of security to see who is who in Bonaberry. I've been staying in this quarter for more than 15 years. Yes. Uh, what is surprising us here is that we don't know whether the mayor of uh, the Dwala 4 Council knows that there's a quarter called uh, Deseglis Ndobo. My brother, you yourself look at the road. We don't have any road here. Gutters. They don't clean the gutters. People are staying inside inside waters. The gutters. We don't even know. You see, children, many people are sick today because of these things. If somebody is, is not sound now, you will see we don't have means of going out. 
We don't have roots. We don't have anything. Nothing, nothing can pass. When I came here, there was nothing here. There was just a small water that was passing here. Like there, like that, that was a very big farm. There was a, 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 a purple that they were cultivating. I myself about cultivating there. And we kept leaves there. There was nothing like a gutter. So after some time, when these people came, they start arranging this hole. Then they send the water this way. That is when the gutter start digging. They start digging. Then there was much water. Water from Love Usu, water from uh, Katos. All is passing by through this way. That's why the place is digging like this. Up to some of the tenants, they have gone out because they cannot stay there. You see the house now, very soon it will reach the gate. And we, we already pack our loads because we are afraid that the thing will break. That's why we, we are just staying there in fear. Yes, we cannot sleep even when the rain is falling, we cannot even sleep the whole night. We have one uh, newspaper that has published that one parliamentarian said that this is not an information. This is defamation, uh, rumor, but in no way that could be regarded as an information. And if it is not an information, then we should not be commenting on that. We are expecting as Cameroonians much more from our media. We are expecting them, particularly in those difficult days, to be very careful with the information that they are uh, uh, publicizing and um, because we Cameroonians rely heavily on them to let us know what is really happening in this country. We have things happening in our country on a daily basis and there's much to talk about. Let, let's not uh, spend our time and energy on uh, dragging people's attention away from the real issues that we are facing in the country at the moment. Yes, we are talking and we will continue to do so and we will um, make whatever it takes to make this country uh, recover from the several crises, wars and difficulties that it has been uh, facing up until now. We are so happy at the end of uh, the inauguration of uh, the new parish of Emana Dallas. We are so happy because we discovered that uh, in spite of all what is said and done in the evangelical church, the people of God who have come to the church to worship God is still worshiping God. And we encourage them to worship God again and again and again. When we come to the church, our target is to worship God and not to to struggle and not to fight against one another. And we encourage all the people of God to, to remember that they have come to the church to worship and be interested essentially by the worship of God. And so God will bless the church and bless our nation. Welcome back, Charles Nana, crisis and a safety management expert, former U.S. Uh, Senate uh, candidate. You've been uh, closely following up happenings in the Republic of Cameroon and reactions from the international community. What's your take on the involvement of uh, other uh, countries so far? Well, <clears throat> I look at it in two ways. When you say foreign countries, I'll take what happened. We had, a, we had Cameroon lost a unique opportunity when the ambassador of the United States made an outing. First thing in diplomacy, I really don't understand where some of our, these are professors in the rig. First thing in diplomacy, always assume good intentions. The, pro, the, the, the ambassador uh, had suggested that we begin thinking that our president, our president Bia begins thinking about retirement. I am barely 50 years old. I have begun thinking about my succession plan. I have a will. I have already set things in place. So I don't understand what is wrong asking the, a, 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 so a, a partner, a very strategic partner, to begin thinking about the future. Second, we had some of our professors 
go out on, uh, on, on the media and t television airwaves and threatening bodily harm to the ambassador of the United States. Why will they be threatening the ambassador of the United States for bodily harm? Don't forget, America is a very strategic partner of the United States, uh, of, of Cameroon. The United States gave Cameroon just less than a month ago, or slightly over a month ago, two nice spare planes to help fight Boko Haram in the north. Number three, the United States has over 300 soldiers in the north fighting Boko Haram. Why then do we think that these are professors? Is for it, why do they think that they can go and threaten such a strategic partner? But let's be very clear, right? And this is a Cameroonian problem, or uh, it's a heavy Cameroonian problem. We rely very much on some of these are professors. They have big degrees. They, con they understand the theory 500%, but they have zero, zero experience, hands-on experience. So they, 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 someone has to whisper in the, on the ears of the head of state that we have Cameroonian experts who hands-on experience who can help the country go, move forward. Yes, those, those, to this crisis to just, just one second. Those professors have done more harm to Cameroon that they have done good by going out and threatening a diplomat of one of the, of one of the superpowers, threatening them with bodily harm. They have done more harm to Cameroon than they have, that, than they have helped. Because what has happened since then? Uh, uh, Ambassador Sullivan came out and said Cameroon should focus to fix its issues, but not threaten the United States. Uh, Nikki Haley went to the United Nations and said the U.S. will take uh, uh, will bypass the U.N. to provide release, relief efforts in Cameroon. Uh, uh, the United Nations has recognized that it's a humanitarian crisis in Cameroon, and so many other things has occurred, and they are occurring now in a rapid pace. Because, and I think partly because, I could be wrong, again, it's my opinion, because some of our professors went out and are threatening an, amb an American ambassador with bodily harm. Meanwhile, pro most probably, the guy had good intentions. You cannot, for you to begin accusing someone, you have to eliminate all possible good intentions from whatever statement they had said. If I had come here and said, Mr. Babila, you get big head. You don't necessarily have to take it in a negative context, right? Because that big head could have mean that you have a lot of book in your head. And that's why they call you big book. Isn't that correct? Don't we call people with, uh, who are very well intellectual, who are very smart, big book? But if you had taken it that he, he was talking about the size of your head and the shape of your head, then you get into a fight. He didn't have any bad intentions. All right, Always know. assume good intentions. And that is number one in diplomacy. And our diplomats blew that, uh, blew that they made a big mistake. They yeah. used the wrong approach. We cannot always be fighting with our partners. Let's learn how to, when an incident occurs, bring experts, crisis experts. How do we, and then discuss how you can handle it and then take it forward from that aspect, from that perspective. All right, we're going to conclude this edition of the program with you. You attempted to become a senator in the United States of America. How was your attempt? You didn't make it, though. No, we didn't make it. Uh, it's quite interesting. But I want to, we didn't make it. We had 43.6% of the votes. But I want to point out that you have, Af as I mentioned before, you have Africans in the United States who go to the top schools. We are among the best. I worked, I spent most of my career with General Electric, which is one of the best companies in the United States. I went to University of Chicago, which is the number one business school, not only in the United States, but in the world. Africans, we have 3.5, 3.5 million Africans in the United States. Not a single one has run for national office. What are we scared of? What are we scared of? We, we, we contribute politically, economically, socially, and culturally to the United States, but we don't have a single first-generation African in leadership in the United States. We have to change that. And uh, secondly, the other aspect of my, the reason why I ran is also to give hope to our first-generation children, our children born in the United States. We would love for them to come to Cameroon. Again, that's why we're fighting for dual nationality. But if they decide to run, they decide to stay in the diaspora, they should be scared of nothing. They know that they are born there, they can go to the top schools, and they can become leaders. the world leaders of the, the leaders of the world. 
Cameroon, and one, one last thing, one third, one third of every African with a tertiary degree is in the diaspora. Meanwhile, Africa desperately needs that expertise to come on and help. I really play, since I know it's the end of the program, I'm really pleading with our leaders not to look at their brothers and sisters in the diaspora as enemies. We are all children of Cameroon. We dream, we bleed, and when we see things not going well in Cameroon, it hurts us tremendously. And that is why some of us have abandoned everything we had to do in the United States to come home and help not only defuse the crisis, but put Cameroon in the path forward. Bring this crisis to an end. Bring these are young men who have a lot of energy. They want to contribute in the economic and social development of Cameroon. Put them to work. We can do it. Cameroon has so much land, so much land. Get these young university students. Let them put their brains into farming. And then help also take another group, put them in transforming those agri agricultural products into value-added products. So we can begin to export. The United States has an Agoa program which we can leverage. But we don't have the quality product because we don't put our best and brightest in agriculture. That reminds us the famous statement of uh, former U.S. President Barack Obama. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, and yes, we will. We just need our youth to understand how interconnected our economies and our peoples are. We are one nation, but with diverse cultures, we have to live the dreams of our forefathers. Our forefathers wanted a Cameroon that was very bilingual, that was bicultural, that every single child would be proud and make Cameroon Africa in miniature. Charles. We have a lot of opportunities. We must take advantage of it and tell our children we all made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's infallible. Let's come together and build this nation. Cameroon is our nation and we will build it together. Cameroon is our nation. Charles Nana, crisis and safety management expert and former U.S. Senate candidate. Thanks for joining us in this edition of The Insight. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure being in Cameroon. And if there's anything I can help, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. Take the appointment for next Sunday for another edition of the program.